he's back. How do I know that Salmonella has got a new video out? Well, because within five minutes of the release of this video, I had 20 comments already from people. You guys never fail to impress me with how on top of this stuff you are. And while I'm subscribed to him and got the notification myself, I did actually see a few of the comments before I even saw the video was out. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah, he's back and the video has already got over 2 million views in the first not even 48 hours. So I'm trusting that you have already seen it. If you haven't, please go over there and check it out. Watch it first. I'll put the link down in the description so you can check it out without my commentary. We want to encourage this guy to keep making content. It's hilarious and interesting. Uh, so I did hear from my friend, Mr. Terry, who's already done a reaction to this. And he kind of warned me, hey, typical in typical Salmonella fashion, not family friendly. So those of you who uh, count on me being a fr family friendly channel, which I try to be not all the channels I react to are and that's okay Just fair warning, uh, but I'm excited to dive into this one. I don't know a lot about this guy beyond the basics I know he's a, a Chinese warlord around the turn of the century like late 19th early 20th century during the time of like the Russo-Japanese War and, and some of the civil wars that are going on in China uh, a lot Beyond that, I don't really know. So I'll try to offer some commentary where I can, some information, some background. We maybe will look up a couple of things in the process. Let's all learn together. Links in the description to check it out without my commentary. Let's dive in. Kids. Today, I've got another character study for you all, a man known as Zhang Zengshan. In 1881, he was born into poverty in the Shandong region of China. His father was a head shaver. Not a barber, mind you. If a head shaver is a barber, then a ditch shaver is an architect. He also moonlit at... So what is a head shaver then? Let's look that up. I've been digging for the last 10 minutes. I haven't been able to find anything on this other than it being someone who shaved heads uh, in a particular way. Um... If you know more about this area of history and what he's kind of getting at that he's implying it's not really what we think it is, let me know in the comment section. As an alcoholic, his mom, meanwhile, was a literal practicing witch and exorcist, already a recipe for success. Zhang joined a group of roving bandits at age 20, as one does, right around the Xinhai Revolution, where the Qing Dynasty was overthrown and the Republic of China was established. But in 1916, the kidneys of the nation's widely disliked monarchist leader done shat the bed, causing a power vacuum that ultimately led to what is known as the warlord era of the Republic. During so, I'm not really, like, deeply into Chinese history, so I can't give like mega details on this stuff, but like a lot of countries for most of history, it was not united in the sense that we think of it today. We look at that map and we see China as one nation. It was not always that way. And there were moments when it would unite under certain rulers and then it would fracture again and you'd have warlords or you'd have varying uh, degrees of empires. That's true in most countries for the last couple of thousand years, and China is no different than that. During this time, different regions of China were constantly shifting hands between a collection of separate military groups, all of whom were ruthless both to each other and to the people they ruled over. And through charisma, favors to the right people, and a keen sense of military pragmatism, our humble highwaymen soon came to be one of these warlords. Now, so, I want to go a little bit deeper on this whole thing with China, because... We, I think mostly, especially in Western culture, we think of the deadliest wars in human history to be like World War II and World War I, right? But some of the deadliest wars in human history, especially when you talk about as a percentage of population, they were Chinese civil wars. Let's take a look. All right, so here on the BorganProject.org, they've uh, put together a kind of a top 10 list of the deadliest wars in history. Number one, of course, World War II. The Second Sino-Japanese War, which really you could argue is a part of World War II. Um, it was, it, it's not always considered that way because it was independent of a global war. It was really just between those two nations, uh, though there was involvement by other nations. Um, but then here you go. Number three, uh, the Qing Dynasty, conquest of the Ming Dynasty. 25 million people. This is in the 17th century. 25 million people. Uh, I want to, I keep stopping and going further down this rabbit trail, but I want to show you why that matters so much. 
We've got, what, nearly 8 billion people on the planet today. The estimate for world population in 1600 is about 500 million people. So 25 million people, think about that in terms of percentage. That's 5% of the world population all in one country died during that war. Uh, the Taiping Rebellion, another war in China. So second, third, and fourth deadliest wars in history took place involving China. Another 20 to 30 million deaths in the 1800s between 1850 and 1864. This is going on while the American Civil War is going on. World War I. Then there's the Lushan Rebellion, another one in China. This is in the 8th century. 36 million people. Two-thirds of the population of China died in that war. And I'm guessing that's a significant chunk of the population of the world at that time. Chinese Civil War, number nine. Eight million casualties uh, by 1950. So there you have it. I mean, that is, that's pretty significant. Zhang was quite skilled as the leader of war. After the Russian Civil War, he recruited thousands of fleeing white Russians, not beverages, but Bolshevik butchers, which Bolshevik... So my understanding is he could speak Russian. Going back to his time, uh, he kind of allied himself um, with the Russians during the Russo-Japanese War. And kind of, you know, when, when you're somebody who looks to rise to power through force and through power, you tend to look for power vacuums. You look for opportunities to jump on the side of a much more powerful force, in this case, the Russians, uh, even though they lost that war miserably. Um so he sides himself with them. He learns Russian. That's probably why he's able to ally himself with these these Russians after the Civil War. He bolstered his battalions and brought big bonuses to his bloodshed. He also made efficient use of armored trains, which proved to be highly cost-effective at transporting large amounts of troops and supplies. But that's not what you people care about. You want some clownage. Well, rest assured, Zhang was quite the character. Now, we all know the age-old debate between positive and negative reinforcement. On the one hand, if you treat people well, you'll probably get the same treatment back later down the line. But on the other hand, nobody's ever taught a tiger to jump through flaming hoops with just pets and temptations. And if you think that's messed up, that's because, well, yeah, it is. Circuses are fucking evil. But like all great leaders, Zhang knew how to appropriately apply both the carrot and the stick. As an example of the former, he defeated the forces of enemy general Wu Pei Fu largely by convincing members of his army to defect, with the promise that they could keep mm. their original rank after switching sides, which he fulfilled. But then he was like, yeah, I don't know if my loyal men would be too happy about being outranked by strangers. Promote them all. Well, only one solution here. All my guys are ranking up. Problem was, so many officers were promoted that Zhang literally ran out of gold and silver to make new insignias. He was like, ah, I gotta think about this. Went out for a smoke, looked down, hey, wait a minute. And had the rest of the emblems made out of the colorful foil found in cigarette packages. It said, hey, necessity is the mother of invention. You just go with what you can. That during the promotion ceremony, people would look down and notice their little star already had a rip in it before the event was even over. But hey, there's still a colonel or poobah or whatever now, they can't complain. On another occasion, he proudly announced that he would either win an upcoming battle or return home in his coffin. And though Zhang was many things, he was not a liar. So after he ended up retreating, his men paraded him through the streets in a casket while he waved and sheafed on a cigar. So you're probably wondering awesome. why they called him the dog meat general. At this point, my head was swimming with lurid fantasies about him eating dog flesh or wearing dog flesh or eating eating dog flesh. Turns out, nah, he was just real into pie gal, of which the act of playing was colloquially referred to as eating dog meat. That's real. This is going to come across poorly. That's really kind of disappointing. That's where the name comes from. Not that I'm disappointed that he didn't eat dogs, but I was expecting a little more. And also because he ate dogs. He was also Wait, you can't just gloss over that. Wait, let's go back. Of which the act of playing was colloquially referred to as eating dog meat. And also because he ate dogs. Zhang reportedly ate meat of black chow chow dogs every day as it was popularly believed at the time that this meat would boost a man's virility. Stranger things have been done in the name of boosting one's virility, so I'm not real surprised. He was also sometimes jokingly referred to as the three don't knows, since he didn't know how much money he had, how many concubines he had, or how many men were in his army. While funny, there was some truth to the nickname, which did sometimes cause issues. Some were minor. For one, he had a lot of trouble remembering the names of the 30 to 50 women of all nationalities in his harem, but he got around this by just assigning them numbers. Number four is real flexible, 27 makes a killer quiche, watch out for 14, she's a biter. And so Here's the problem that I'm seeing with this. You can rise to power on making promises, on your charisma, on your abilities as a leader, 
Um, but you can't stay in power with, without some degree of organization, right? You can't do everything yourself. And as you gain more power, you've got to have a way of organizing and delegating. And you have to have a firm handle on what's going on. So I can see how this guy could quickly shoot up to power, but then lose it all just as quickly because he doesn't know how to hang on to it properly so forth. Other times, things got a little more dire. Later in his career, Zhang became the military governor of the province uh, of Shandong, go and while well. the warlord life suited him, domestic affairs were another story. Rampant human rights violations aside- See, this is one of the things that people forget when we talk about Napoleon Bonaparte, right? Say what you want about him being a dictator and, and the deaths that were caused, and I'm not trying to downplay those. Napoleon is one of those rare people that could both do the military, he could win the battles on the battlefield, and he was a skilled tactician and, uh, strategist, but he also did pretty well with the civil side of things in terms of laws and managing things. And not always, right? He, there was a lot of nepotism and, and he couldn't manage continued struggles with battles in places like Spain and stuff like that. But, but as a military leader, he did both fairly well. Reputation as a ruthless and brutal and ruthless warlord, warlord split skulls of the prisoners with his sword and hanging dissidents from telephone poles. His concubines have been so forcibly seized from rich families. Part of that's probably exerting power over those families, I would think. Um, connected to criminal gangs and drug trade makes sense. Side, the whole thing was just way poorly managed. For example, while Zhang did collect taxes on everything from theater performances to tobacco examination licenses, relatively little of his extortions went towards his war efforts or anything practical, with most of it being funneled into vanity projects and his own personal riches. So how did he fund his army? Well, for those playing at home, it's time to take a shot. Cause Zhang printed tens of millions of dollars worth of paper money in the form of military inflation. stamps with no reserve to back them up. Obviously, massive inflation ensued, but Zhang just said, no, -uh. insisted the stamps had a one-to-one -one version with real money and continued paying his men at the same rate. Fortunately for them, the invisible hand of the market is no match for the very visible fist of the soldier because they just kick old merchant ladies' asses till they accepted the currency at face value. Now that works within your own territory where you can enforce that and you can tell people, no, 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 it's still worth exactly what it was worth before even though we printed a whole bunch more of it. But that doesn't work when you're trying to trade with other places and you can't produce everything you need on your own in your own province, right? Eventually you're gonna have to trade for other things. I have a feeling this is gonna have an effect on the market around them. But unfortunately, kicking old ladies' asses can't solve everything. In the summer of 1927, Shandong was hit with a famine caused primarily by drought. At the time, many people prayed to Zhang Xian, a folk deity. You can't print food. And if you don't have food where you are, you gotta get it from outside. And that money's not worth the same to them. This is why this guy's never gonna be able to hang on to power. He just doesn't have the organizational ability to do it. In an attempt to bring rain to these crusty lands. But Zhang Zhengsheng, he don't get on his knees for nobody. He walked right up to the statue in Xian's temple, starts bitch slapping it, tells it to go fornicate with its sister, and then has his artillery crew fire shells straight into the sky for hours on end to show that god who he's dealing with. Sources differ on All when right, the next here's the deal. I don't agree with this guy on a lot of things. That was kind of awesome. I have to acknowledge that was kind of awesome. It was, but it did eventually rain. So in the end, Zhang Shang got the last laugh. Speaking of which, our boy was also a renowned poet. Here's a piece he wrote about that very event. <clears throat> the sky god is also named Zhang. Why does he make life hard for me? If it doesn't rain in three days, I'll demolish your temple. Then I'll have cannons bombard your mom. That's not a bad poem, really. It's really not bad. Then I'll have cannons bombard your mom. Now, obviously, translations are not equal, so we don't know if exactly this is how it came across to people reading Chinese, but it's still kind of awesome. Truly prophetic. He's got a few other good ones, too. Let me just dim the lights real quick. Yeah. This one's called Visiting Mount Tai. From afar, Mount Tai looks blackish. Narrow on top and wide at the bottom. If you flipped it upside down, it would be narrow at the bottom and wide on top. I like that one a lot because it's... That one kind of sucks. Not impressed by that one. Like he heard about metaphors without realizing they're supposed to have a second meaning. This one's titled, Poem About Bastards. You tell me to do this, he tells me to do that. You are all bastards, go fuck your mother. Poignant. But unlike most poets, besides E.E. E. Cummings and Emily Dickinson, Zhang was- I love how he just drops some legit poets in there in context of this guy. Quite well endowed. He was often referred to as General 86, as when Zhang Jr. stood up straight, he could reportedly reach the length of 86 Mexican silver dollars stacked atop one another, given a thickness of two point- First of all, why Mexican silver dollars? 
four millimeters, this would put him at around 20.6 centimeters or 8.1 inches. That's especially impressive given that he was likely malnourished during puberty due to both poverty and the 1896 famine. You racist. I thought of a few other jokes about this, but I couldn't fit him in the narrative, so I'll just rattle him off. Should have been called the horse meat general. When he got out of the pool, he was general 12. This one just says dong hung dong. You get the point. But all great things must eventually come to an end. I need to stop and process all of this for just a second. Okay, I think I'm good. Let's move on. After suffering a series of defeats at the hands of his enemies and a subsequent failed rebellion against a quickly reunifying China, Zhang was forced to run away in 1928, bringing his mom with him to Beppu, Japan. His time he Interesting that he went to Japan considering he sided with Japan's enemies during the Russo-Japanese War, but I don't know if they would have known that or not. Here was relatively uneventful, except for when he shot a former prince in the back for trying it on with one of his concubines. And Cordy said the gun just happened to go off while he was pointing it at the center of the guy's mass. For some reason, they're like, <laughs> nothing suspicious here. Gave him the choice between 15 days in prison or a $150 fine. He ch and I've read a little bit about this. My understanding is that he... Sh the guy he shot was actually like a cousin of a deposed emperor. Uh, so... You would think it would be a big deal, but 15 days or a $150 fine for shooting and killing someone chose the latter. Zhang's story finally came to an end in 1932, when he went back to Shandong, not as a conqueror, but as a visitor. Unfortunately, it seems it takes people more than four years to get over murder, because he was... This is a really important point to make here. When you rise to power using ruthless tactics, and you are responsible for the deaths of tens or even hundreds of thousands or even millions of people. We talked about this with the JFK series, right? Uh, we, we tend to think that powerful, influential, historic figures, if they are killed in some fashion, that there's got to be some grand conspiracy behind it. But it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes it's just a lone crazy person or a lone really upset person or a relative of someone that you wronged in some way. And when you've wronged hundreds of thousands of people, that's a lot of potential enemies. And it only takes one of them to be willing to go that extra step. And that's what happens here was unceremoniously assassinated by the nephew of an officer that he had executed. All in all, Zhang left behind quite a strange legacy. Given the litany of horrible crimes that I've seemed to kind of gloss over, he's generally regarded as the stinkiest stain of an already messy portion of the tapestry that is Chinese history. The only remaining question is if one can truly separate the art from the artist. During his rule, Time Magazine described him as China's basest warlord. I'll let you decide whether or not they forgot the DE. That's all for today. Till next time, I'm Salmonella, and I'm hiding in your fridge. And I'm hiding in your fridge. That's fantastic. Uh, if you want to do a little more reading on this guy, let me show you uh, an article that I um, stumbled upon recently about him. So this is all over on AsianStudies.org, and I'll put a link down in the description if you want to check it out. It's a PDF file. It's only five pages, but it's A Tale of Two Warlords, Republican China During the 1920s by Matthew Port Portwood and John P. Dunn. And it goes into a little more detail in a scholarly article about this guy and the time in which he lived, if you want to check that out. Also, if you are a patron or a member, uh, we're getting back into recording a day ahead, so you'll be able to see tomorrow's video today. So be watching for that link to be posted in just a little while. And if you haven't already considered, the link's right there on the screen to Patreon, patreon.com slash VTH or down in the description, and you can see everything a day in advance. Thanks for watching.